Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Saurabh Paliwal from Biocon's Investor Relations team. And I would like to welcome you to this earnings call for the second quarter of fiscal 23. I would like to indicate that all participant lines will be in the listen only mode. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions after the opening remarks conclude. Should you need to ask a question, please select the raise hand option under the reactions tab of the Zoom application. We will call out your name and unmute your line. While asking, please begin with your name and your organization. Please note that the chat box in the Zoom application is disabled, but you can raise any technical concerns by sending us an email to investor.relations at biocon.com. Please note that this conference is being recorded. The recording will be made available on our website within a day, and the transcript of the call shall be made available subsequently. Today, to discuss the company's business performance and outlook for the quarter, we have Dr. Kiran Muzumdar Shaw, our executive chairperson, Mr. Siddharth Mittal, CEO and MD of Piacon Limited, along with other senior management colleagues across the business segments, including generics, biosimilars, and research services. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone about the safe harbor related to today's earnings call. Comments made during the call may be forward looking in nature based on management's current beliefs and expectations. It must be viewed in relation to the risks that our business faces that could cause our future results, performance, or achievements to differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. After the end of this call, if you need any further information or, or clarifications, please do get in touch with me. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to a chairperson for her opening remarks. Over to you, Kiran. Thank you, Saurabh. Uh, good morning, everyone. I welcome you to Biocon's earnings call for the second quarter FY23. I would like to spend a minute to pay tribute to my late husband, John McCallum Marshall Shaw, former vice chairman of the Biocon Group. John passed away on October 24th in Bengaluru. As a key member of the board and management of Biocon since 1999, John Shaw has contributed majorly to the transformation of Biocon into a globally recognized innovation-led biopharmaceutical company. In his 22 years with Biocon, he played a very important role in building the company, ensuring the highest levels of corporate governance as well as contributing to the financial and strategic development of the Biocon Group. He retired from the board of directors of Biocon on July 23rd, 2021 due to health reasons. John Shaw was a man who stood tall with his values and inspired many. He was a benevolent, erudite and compassionate person who truly believed in philanthropy and believed that it would make this world a better place. He was my greatest mentor and my trusted business partner. John's vision for Biocon will continue to guide us towards our purpose of enabling equitable access to healthcare worldwide and for Biocon to become a global leader in its chosen areas. With that, let me now turn to the earnings call let me start by commenting on some macroeconomic dynamics. The global economy is in its steepest slowdown since 1970. The IMF has forecast that global economic growth will slow to 3.2% in 2022 and is likely to slide further to 2.9% in 2023 from the 6.1% that we saw in 2021. However, India is an outlier in the current geopolitical scenario. The continued war in Ukraine, which seems to be now receding, the alienation of China and other trade alignments are compelling a shift of manufacturing to countries like India. I therefore believe that India is uniquely poised for strong export-led growth in coming times. While high inflation continues to make headlines across the globe, spiraling healthcare costs do need to be addressed. 
Adoption of both generics and more particularly biosimilars is a necessity and not an option anymore. The Biocon group with its export-led business profile is well poised to break out of the economic challenges of both recession and inflation. Research services, manufacturing, and the increasing demand for both generics and biosimilars offer attractive growth opportunities for the group. While growth is critical, sustainability is amongst Biocon's topmost priorities, and the company is committed to build a sustainable future. On the back of key initiatives undertaken during the past year, I'm pleased to share that in 2022, SP Global Corporate Sustainability Assessment released in October 22 that Biocon has improved its ESG score to 52 from the previous year's score of 45. Let me now turn to some board updates. I would like to start by welcoming Peter Baines as an additional director on the board of Biocon Limited. With over three decades of experience in biopharmaceuticals and a successful track record of building brands, businesses, and companies, we believe that Peter's thought leadership will add tremendous value to the Biocon board. Before I turn to key financial highlights of the quarter, I would like to give you an update on the Viatris acquisition. The acquisition of Viatris's biosimilars business is expected to close shortly. Biocon Biologics will issue $1 billion of convertible securities and make an upfront payment of $2 billion to Viatris on closing the transaction. Biocon Biologics has secured the $1.2 billion of debt, and the balance amount of $800 million will be funded through $650 million of equity infusion by Biocon and $150 million equity infusion by Serum. With regulatory approvals that are required to close the Viatris transaction being in place, it is, we believe, imperative to, to close the transaction expeditiously in order to realize and recognize the benefits of the deal. This will allow us to start transition and integration of the business at the earliest. The equity infusion of 650 million from Biocon will be funded from two to $30 million from its existing reserves, including the stake sale in Sinjin and the remaining $420 million through mezzanine funding. We are in the process of securing investments to retire the mezzanine finance post-deal closure. Biocon stake in Biocon Biologics will be 68% post the Viatris and Serum transactions. In terms of integration and commercial success, Biocon Biologics will accrue revenue and profits emanating from the Viatris acquisition. The deal also incorporates a two-year transition services agreement or TSA to ensure seamless business continuity. Under the agreement, Viatris will transfer key commercial teams to, be, to Biocon Biologics. In the meanwhile, key leadership hires have been made at BBL to ensure smooth integration as well as commercial success, particularly in advanced markets, which include, of course, North America, Europe, and other advanced markets. Key leadership hires include Mr. Matthew Eric, Chief Commercial Officer, Advanced Markets, Stephen Feco, Jr., Global Head of Supply Chain Management, Stephen Manzano, General Counsel, Advanced Markets. And we also have onboarded key talents in our advanced market commercial teams to build market access and pricing, US policy and advocacy capabilities. We believe that this team that we have now hired puts us in a good position 
to address the integration and transition requirements of the deal in a very efficient manner. Let me now turn to financial highlights. At a consolidated group level, revenues for Q2 FY23 were up 23% on a year-on-year -year basis at rupees 2,384 crores. Revenues from our biosimilars business and research services delivered strong year-on-year -year growth of 34% and 26% respectively, while our generics business grew at a healthy 18%. Core EBITDA grew 34% to rupees 816 crores, representing healthy core operating margins of 35% compared to 33% in the same quarter last fiscal. Our gross R&D spend was at rupees 252 crores versus 165 crores in the same period in the last fiscal an increase of 52 crores year on year. This, of course, reflects our advancing pipeline that will drive our future growth. This spend corresponds to 16% of revenues ex Sinji. Of the 252 crores, 242 crores is expended in the PNL, while the balance amount has been capitalized. This is a 96 crore rupee increase in R&D expenses over Q2 FY22. During the quarter, we also recorded a forex loss of, approx of rupees 82 crores as compared to a gain of 20 crores during Q2 FY22. This includes 35 crores of foreign currency translation loss on account of the Goldman Sachs OCD investment in Biocon Biologics. With this, the reported EBITDA for the quarter was Rs. 535 crores versus 551 crores in the same period, with the EBITDA margin at 22%. Profit before tax and exceptional items stood at Rs. 246 crores compared to 276 crores during the same quarter last fiscal. The net profit for the quarter, excluding exceptional items, stood at 168 crores versus 188 crores in Q2 FY22. When it comes to exceptional items this quarter, I would like to uh, basically focus on the fact that a mat credit balance charge of rupees 107 crores has been incorporated as an exceptional loss uh, exceptional uh, item the company has decided to adopt the new tax regime of 25% which helps biocon to reduce its tax outflow and pnl charges on a go forward basis we believe this is an important step that we are taking. And this is, of course, a, a charge to our PNL. Professional fees, net of taxes of rupees 14 crores towards the Viatris deal also comprises part of the exceptional items. And therefore, reported net profit for the quarter is at rupees 47 crores. Let me now turn to segmental performance discussions, and I will start with generics. The generic segment delivered revenues of 623 crores during the quarter, which is a year-on-year -year growth of 18%. Profit before tax for the quarter was at 54 crores versus 50 crores uh, on a year-on-year -year basis, which is a growth of 9%. Sequentially, as well, revenues grew by 7%. This quarter, we had two important API launches of Sitagliptin and Vildagliptin in the EU that were supplied from brownfield capacity expansion at our Bengaluru and Vishakapatnam plants. The generic formulations business also secured several important approvals for our vertically integrated products in the EU and rest of the world markets, providing further impetus to our geographical expansion 
uh, in the quarters ahead. In terms of the pricing of, uh, environment, we are seeing some moderation in raw material and logistic costs. However, the environment continues to remain challenging, especially in the US. On the CapEx front, the generics business made progress on two important projects with the completion of commissioning and qualification of our Vishakapatnam immunosuppressants facility and our Bengaluru peptides facility. Process validation batches are scheduled to commence at both sites in Q3 of this fiscal. Now turning to biosimilars. Biocon Biologics recorded revenues of rupees 997 crores, a year-on-year -year growth of 34%, fueled by the growth of insulin glargine in the US. Core EBITDA stood at rupees 449 crores, which is up 48% year-on-year. And core EBITDA margin improved to 46% versus 42%. Primarily on account of the rupee depreciation and accrual of PN, PLI benefits. We continue to make good progress on our R&D pipeline, spearheaded by Denosumumab and Ustekinumab, our biosimilar programs which are in fa global phase 1 and phase 3 clinical trials. Consequently, R&D investments for the quarter increased by 142% year-on-year, to rupees 184 crores or 18% of BBL revenues. While this is higher than our guidance of 12 to 15% of sales, we believe it will normalize once we accrue revenues from serums, uh, vaccines, and biatrices biosimilars businesses. This quarter's EBITDA reflects an increase of rupees 108 crores in R&D investments and a non-cash foreign currency translation loss of 35 crores pertaining to Goldman Sachs OCD investment in BBL, which I referred to a little earlier. On a comparative basis, last year's EBITDA included a one-off gain of 55 crores from a mark-to-market movement on our Adagio investment. Therefore, adjusting for the foreign currency translational loss and mark-to-market gains, EBITDA is at the similar level to last fiscal. Profit before tax and exceptions stood at Rs. 78 crores. The Viatris-led business continues to demonstrate a strong year-on-year -year performance, underpinned by increasing penetration of our interchangeable insulin glargine in the U.S., our Glargine's total prescription market share is trending around 12%, while new prescriptions are at 14%. We are seeing an increased uptake of our full filler or peg fill grastin in the US, and its market share has now surpassed 10%. Ogivri's market share has also started to recover following a temporary dip in Q1 and is now around 10%. In Europe, Julio continues its strong performance in key markets such as Germany and France, where it has 18% and 9% market share, respectively. We entered into a strategic outlicensing agreement with Yoshindo in Japan for commercializing two of our pipeline assets, Ustekirumab and Denosumumab in Japan. In summary, the existing business continues to see healthy and profitable performance with an opportunity to ramp up revenues. The conclusion of the strategic deals with Viatris and Serum will transform Biocon Biologics into a leading vertically integrated global biologics enterprise driving value for all our stakeholders. Now a short commentary on novels. Equilium, our US-based partner, announced encouraging interim data from the Equalize study evaluating itolizumab in patients with lupus nephritis. The study continues to enroll patients with top-line data expected in mid-2023. An application for conducting phase two clinical trials with itolizumab for ulcerative colitis was approved by DCGI 
in October 2022. Our Boston-based associate Baikara Therapeutics led a molecule BCA101 uh, in, in combination with pembrolizumab was evaluated in frontline systemic patients with unresectable recurrent or metastatic head and neck squamous cell carcinoma with very encouraging response rates. During this quarter, BCA101 as a monotherapy was also evaluated in patients with advanced or incurable cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma who have received previous anti-PD-1 therapy. Investor interest in Baikara has greatly increased following positive out outcomes of the various clinical trials. I will now turn to research services or Syngene International. Revenues from operations grew 26% to Rs. 768 crores over the corresponding quarter last year. Reported EBITDA was up 22% to 232 crores. Profit before tax and exceptional item was 130 crores, up 15% over the corresponding quarter last year. The second quarter results reflect positive performances across all divisions. Discovery services experienced sustained demand. And during the quarter, the proprietary integrated drug discovery platform Synvent continued to gain traction with 18 integrated programs. Development services benefited from repeat orders of existing clients, as well as an increase in the number of collaborations with emerging biopharma companies. In manufacturing services, the long-term biologics manufacturing agreement signed with Zoetis in the first quarter is expected to be transformational for the manufacturing services division in the years to come. The agreement has the potential to be worth up to $500 million over the next 10 years. I would like to conclude by saying that our performance during the first half has demonstrated the resilience of Biocon's business model as we build the company of the future with all segments delivering strong revenue growth. We believe that the second half of this fiscal is on a firm footing as we approach the closure of the acquisition of Viatris' biosimilars business and the vaccine alliance with Serum. Enhanced capacities and new launches will drive growth for our API and genetics formulations business, while continued business momentum should help Sinjin achieve its guidance for the full year. With this, I would like to open the floor to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kiran. I will just wait a, bit a moment for the questions to assemble. Uh, as a reminder, please uh, use the raise hand icon in the reaction style of your Zoom application to ask the question. The first question is from Prakash Agarwal. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good morning to all. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. And also thanks and good morning. Uh, I'm just uh, wanting to understand uh, the mezzanine find, uh, funding that you spoke about. Uh, when is it expected to reverse? In the past we have talked about that we are looking for private equity investors to come in. Uh, what is the reason for the delay, if you could uh, elaborate there? So, Prakash, we are in discussions uh, with various uh, private equity investors, but uh, as Kiran mentioned in the opening remark, that we want to close the transaction very quickly so that we can realize the benefits of this uh, acquisition and start the transition. And uh, within the next uh, few months, we expect the the re retiring the short term debt we'll be taking to fund this uh, payout immediately and would be closing uh, raising the funds from private equity to square off the mezzanine finance okay and these are rupee debt uh, or yes rupee debt and around coupon or around 7% 7 7.5% seven, seven okay understood 
uh, and secondly, uh, if there's an update on BEVA and ASPART uh, approval timelines, I, I, I read uh, in the presentation that the CAPA plans already submitted, but what is our internal thought process in terms of the approvals? Shreyas, if you can take that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, you're right, uh, Prakash. We have, uh, post the inspection, uh, responded to the agency with a comprehensive uh, CAPA plan uh, for Pepecizumab, and we are uh, awaiting uh, the response from the agency uh, to see that we get that approval so that we can commercialize Pepecizumab in the U.S. as quickly as we, it's possible. You know that we already have approval from the EU for Pepecizumab uh, for that facility and that site. But sir, any timelines that uh, we think so that we can pen in the models? At this stage, we have no indication on the timeline, but we are uh, engaging with them to see how we can expedite. Typically, post submission of a response, it takes anywhere between 45 to 60 working days for them to respond. But that's usually our past experience because we can't comment on behalf of the agency as to when they will come back to us. And the other product from Malaysia, Asport. Uh, for Asport, as you know, uh, you know we've uh, we responded to the inspection uh, with the CAPA plan. We, we did receive a, a CRL, a complete response letter, in uh, in October. Uh, the agency did point out that uh, there is no uh, you know a pending or a repeat thing from the previous CRL. Uh, there's also nothing that we see on the scientific uh, aspect of the dossier or the or the science of the of the development of the product. They wanted to see the completion of the actions that we have um, committed to in the CAPA plan. They've invited us for a conversation that is currently scheduled with the agency. And post having that uh, dialogue with the agency, we should be able to uh, get clarity as to uh, how we will be able to uh, get that product to approval. Um, again, it's important to note that it's uh, uh, it's not a matter of uh, if, it's a matter of when, and we should be able to provide more clarity once we uh, have an engagement with the agents. Okay, perfect. Uh, that helps. And lastly, on, uh, you know, the timelines, like, uh, so serum deal uh, for just the, uh, you know, the vaccines that start effective first October. So is that understanding correct? Yes. Okay, and uh, the myelin vatris deal, once the payments are done, probably uh, before December, uh, so uh, uh, would the financials be added in the October to December quarter itself, or it would go to the next quarter? It would be from the date of closure. So let's assume if the closure happens by end of this month, it will be from December 1. Okay, thank you and all the Thank you, Prakash. I'll request all participants to limit the questions to two to allow other people in line uh, to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Shyam Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Uh, yeah, good morning, and uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, just the first one on the operational performance at Biocon Biologics. Uh, so if you could help us understand, uh, I think you talked about uh, Glagene market shares reaching on NRX about 14%. So uh, are we on track uh, for the high teens kind of market share? What are some of the dynamics um, that is uh, leading us to continue the, the market share gains that we are seeing right now? Let me respond to that, Sham, and maybe uh, uh, Matt can add further color on that. We've uh, we've seen a very positive, uh, uh, you know, growth in the way the U.S. Uh, market has responded to our interchangeable Clargene. And while we've seen uh, the uptick um, over a period of time where we started the year with um, with a little under three percent to move into that uh, mid uh, closer to that mid teens that we've talked about. It's trending in the right direction. We see Beatrice uh, uh, gathering more customers, uh, you know, almost on a weekly basis. We see them uh, adding more customers to the to the list, uh, and we believe we're trending in the right direction towards that uh, mid to high teens uh, market share in the U.S. that we've uh, targeted. But I'll let uh, Matt uh, talk a little bit more about that. Matt, over to you. You're probably on mute, Matt. Sorry about that. Thank you, Srihas. 
Um, in addition to what Shriyas was saying, we continue to onboard new customers weekly in our government business. So that's trending nicely and we continue to look to secure additional business. And as we go uh, into next quarter, uh, we have some opportunities in which uh, we are pursuing aggressively that could add nicely to the growth that you're seeing in the NRXs, which then will translate into uh, the pull through you see in TRXs. Got it. Uh, just the second uh, sub question is on pricing. Uh, there have been some concerns by market participants around by similar pricing. Um, you know, not U.S. pricing seems to be also kind of QOQ seeing deterioration. So, just your comments on how pricing is trending relative to your expectations. Is that the only lever for market share, or you think uh, there are other ways to gain market share? Um, again, uh, to respond to that, of course, pricing is an important element. Uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, has to be looked at. There's no uh, going away from that discussion. But beyond that, I think uh, most customers are looking at reliability of supply to make sure that you have a, a complete portfolio. In, they're looking at customer, uh, looking at suppliers who have the ability to um, to stay in the market uh, uh, with an end-to-end -end capability. Uh, to uh, to be there in the long run. So clearly there are several levers, not just pricing. Pricing is important, but it's also important that uh, uh, the, the supplier to these customers have uh, a track record, credibility of high uh, quality uh, products that they are developing and, uh, uh, and the su supply uh, ability for these demands that they are creating. So I think it's a, it's a combination of this. In terms of the discounting that you talked about, it's... Um, it's again a factor of competition and market forces. Uh, it's been a very um, reasonable price decline, I would say. It's trended from that 50% to 60% in most markets uh, globally. Even in the US, it's been in that uh, range. We've not seen a cliff uh, in the moment, you know, the moment you have a biosimilar entry, or even if there have been four or five players in a particular asset, we haven't seen a erosion in pricing. Um, uh, in, in a particular uh, asset. So I think there is pricing sanity overall, and we believe that this is uh, likely to be a reflection of the biosimilars uh, uh, marketplace, uh, at least in the, in the near term. Got it. And if I may, my last question is uh, is on the generic business. Um, so this this quarter has been very mixed for the players. You have seen growth, maybe uh, of a smaller base relative to some of the larger incumbents. So Siddharth, what what are you seeing in terms of both API and formulation trends for your business for the generics? Thank you. So we should continue to see some growth coming in in our API business uh, as we have the newer capacities, both from Brownfield and Greenfield in the coming quarters. Uh, of course, the Brownfield for, uh, uh, capacity expansion will give immediate a boost to our growth and Greenfield uh, capacity addition would take some time. When it comes to generic formulation, we, have, as we said, we have got a few approvals in emerging markets. We also have few launches coming up in the U.S. And a combination of these uh, launches plus uh, the growing, the growth in our base business uh, should uh, generate growth in the coming quarter. So overall, the second half of this fiscal, we do expect uh, uh, a high single-digit uh, growth uh, compared to second half of last year. Thank you and all the best. Uh, thank you, Shyam. Uh, next question is from Neha Manpuria from Bank of America. Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my first question is on the biosimilar business. Um, now, we've gained market share in all of our products, uh, you know, uh, in the last few quarters. Glagene has particularly been good. Um, despite that, we've seen flat revenues, which does seem to indicate, you know, uh, either pricing pressure, not only in the US, but uh, in the other markets. Um, so, you know, just wanted to get a sense on, uh, you know, when do you see the next step up in uh, the uh, revenue traction that we're seeing? 
being? That's my first question. And second, um, you know, we've heard a fair bit of, um, you know, discussion on Humaira from, uh, by similar for Humaira from, um, you know, competitors. Uh, I know this is a partnered product for us, but, you know, if you could give any yeah. color on how we stand um, as, uh, you know, this uh, second uh, set of entrants for this product. So may I, maybe I'll take the first question and I'll let Matt talk to, uh, about Adelimumab uh, subsequent to that. So, uh, so in terms of what we had said on the uh, on the revenue numbers we had uh, in the past said that the first two quarters of this uh, year will be around that 1000 crore mark. Uh, and then we will see it break away from that uh, to, a, to a higher level. Uh, we'll go up its steps and we had moved up from that 750 average to about 850 ish and then uh, towards the 1000 pro mark we see that changing in the current quarter and moving uh, to an upward trend uh, specifically to the uh, to the market shares and the revenue uh, uh, correlation that you just talked about uh, two things to uh, to discuss there one is uh, you're right most of our products have recovered in market share if specifically our uh, trastuzumab franchise in the advanced markets which had undergone a a dip in the beginning of the calendar year has recovered very strongly and we see that trending back towards the double digits. So it's certainly been a, a positive trend. In large gene two with the NRX, uh, Matt just described, uh, are trending towards the mid-teens. Uh, and Peckfield Graston, we continue to hold that 10% market share, which is a significant um, uh, threshold that, uh, that we maintain. In Europe, we have continued to also grow. Uh, Trastuzumab in particular and Adelimumab continues to grow there uh, in certain markets, Germany and France in particular. But we've seen that uh, the euro dominate, uh, denominated business that we've, uh, we've seen there has faced uh, 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 pressure on the uh, currency side with the euro depreciation to the dollar. And that has had an impact uh, on some of those uh, numbers that you've seen from a correlation perspective. We see a strong growth in the product, but unless we correct these currency impact, which we believe are, 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 are uh, transient, we will see the business continue to grow in the current quarter and going forward as well. Uh, but maybe Matt, you can now talk about the um, Adelimumab uh, preparations for the US. Yeah. Thanks, Riaz. Uh, so uh, comments on our Julio product, which is uh, our product to Humera. Uh, some key things we're seeing is that, you know, no product or no manufacturer has everything to the innovator. But we, we believe we're in a very good position as we meet with our payer customers and talk with our partner with Beatrice that we have history. We have a lot of European history within our product in that supply, which is key to payers. And we've been able to demonstrate that with our launch of products in Europe, especially with our Julio product and the nice gains that we've seen uh, in that market share. The other thing uh, we believe uh, as we look at launching in the timing is that we believe we're in a very good position. As you see what's going on with the payers now, uh, there seems to be a, a wait and see with most of them as they're waiting to see what's coming with all the uh, different suppliers at the same time. We also have uh, a uniqueness in our device itself, which we believe uh, will be an advantage uh, because it's very similar to the innovator. Uh, so patients will be familiar with how they use the device. Uh, we've been having nice discussions, uh, preliminary discussions uh, with payers, and we believe we're in a good position because most of the player, uh, payers are not going to have exclusivity they will have a N of one or N of two. So that means innovator plus two biosimilars or innovator plus one biosimilars. And with our history that we've demonstrated with our partner with Beatrice and how we've already been in the market with other products the payers are familiar with, we believe it puts us in a very good position uh, as we get ready to launch our Julio product. Answer yeah, uh, sorry, just one follow up, uh, you know, on uh, uh, the uh, uh, on Shreya's question. Shreya, uh, on the emerging market, how has that been trending quarter on quarter? Um, are we seeing uh, growth in the X regulated market business um, as, you know, uh, uh, on the biosimilar side? 
Yes, Nia, I think the emerging markets uh, have also been uh, doing uh, very well for us in all the three franchises that we talked about, but I let Sushil comment specifically on it and, and why we believe second half will be stronger given that uh, we're starting to see the ten tenders which had moved to the to the later part of the year uh, moving uh, in the positive direction. But Sushil, maybe you want to talk about Thank you, Sriyas. In the emerging countries, I think that we have been doing uh, very well over not just quarter, but over the years. If you see in FY21, we were trending at around 200 crores per quarter. FY22, about 250. And this year, we would be trending at about you know 300 crores per quarter. Overall, the business of uh, uh, the emerging countries is largely tender de dependent. So sometimes it gets a little lumpy in terms of the nature of the business. But overall, we are relatively uh, confident that many of the tenders which were delayed in the quarter two will get on to quarter three, which we will win. So that way, the overall trend of the P2P business, as we call it in the emerging countries, is very strong for uh, the products that we are in, especially with insulins and with the Trastuzumab and now with Beva as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Neha. Uh, the next question is from Damian Tikaray from HSBC. Hi, uh, good morning. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, my first question is simply, uh, so can you talk like how the current prescription is split between uh, commercial and Medicare, Medicaid uh, patient and how this trend has been uh, moving in recent time because you have seen good pickup. So that's my first question. Man, do you want to take that question? Yeah, it, look, I'll, I'll try. That's a very high level question, but I, I think it's it's one of channels and how you're maximizing this. Um, there's not a traditional shift in in the way people are uh, put on the plans in the U.S. It's how we're taking advantage of optimizing uh, the channels within the payers as well as the price points. Uh, so you're seeing some of these shifts, and you could see it, see it shift back and forth. It's really taking a look at where is Medicare Part B, Part D, Medicare Advantage, uh, where are the commercial plans and how we go to market and strategically look at that. So you see some shifts, but uh, we are taking advantage where the opportunity uh, lends itself. And so you might be seeing some of that grow in some areas uh, versus others. Sure, Matt. And, uh... In recent contracting cycle for next year, uh, has uh, simply gained a meaningful contrast compared to where we were last year? Uh, I, yeah, I think you'll see, you definitely are seeing those uh, market share growth in the channel. Um, some of the things we'll have to look at is as we uh, look at acquiring or partnering with additional customers, some of that data is not in IQVIA. Um, but we'll see nice growth. And I, I think more that revenue piece is one to continue to watch um, because the way people report information. Uh, but I do see uh, additional uh, partnerships uh, as well as additional pull through, which you're seeing that with the NRXs in existing business uh, coming in the future. Sure. And my last question is uh, both your uh advanced market as well as emerging market biosimilars have uh, picked up. Uh, so that's a good uh, update. So can you just uh, know, like, uh, can you just tell us what is the split right now uh, in terms of biosimilar sales between advanced and uh, emerging market? Uh, Kini, do, you, do you want to give a split, but roughly it's at a little around that 50% mark, just a little over 50 in advanced markets, but maybe you have a little more data on that. For the quarter MNT, it's just under 60 percent uh, advanced markets. So, sorry, uh, 60 percent under 60 percent for advanced markets, advanced markets, and uh, just above 40 percent for uh, emerging markets. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ramanthi. The next question is from Harit Ahmed from Spark Capital. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so uh, on insulin as part the previous CRL in 2019, 
the FDA had some queries on the diluent uh, you were using, and, and I believe you had provided information on the same. So does the recent CRL uh, mention anything related to the diluent, or is it just pertaining to the inspection and the GMP status? Uh, we've, uh, had it, we've been able to respond to the agency on the diluent that they had asked for, and we do not see any inquiry, any further uh, points or comments on that. The current CRL only talks about us completing the uh, CAPA actions to their satisfaction. And there are, of course, some uh, labeling, packaging uh, queries, which are standard whenever you have to uh, close an application uh, in the, in the pre-approval process. So we don't see anything beyond just the facility uh, inspection closure in terms of the CAPA actions. And then, uh, how should we think of the next goal date? I, I missed that in case you mentioned earlier. So the, the agency has asked us to um, engage with them. They want to take us through what really is uh, is needed to close this because we, there is no outstanding item from the previous CRL as well. So we've closed those observations as well. So I think it's important right now to see what is it that the agency is, uh, is looking for before we can uh, look at the resubmission for a, for a new goal date at, the, at this stage. Okay. And then regarding the licensing of uh, two biosimilar assets, uh, Ustakinumab and Denosumab to Yoshindo in Japan, uh, just trying to understand how biosimilar penetration has been in that market. Uh, we've had our Glagene product uh, since 2016 under partnership with Fujifilm. So how has the experience been? How has the product ramp up been? And what share do we have in the Glagene market over there? If you could help. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think a very fair question. Japan continues to be uh, a very important market. It's still the third largest pharmaceutical market in the world and, and for biosimilars as well. Uh, one of the key things about uh, Japan, and it's taken us a while to, um, to get familiar with this, we've been in Japan since 2015 when we've got that approval for insulin glargine through our partner, Fujifilm. Uh, one of the key things in Japan is that a lot of the uh, prices there are regulated uh, through an NHI pricing index. Uh, and in terms of that, the order of entry and the discounting of biosimilars become extremely critical as, uh, as products are launched and, um, and institutions uh, go through uh, contracting uh, for a longer period of time. So there's clearly been a, a lot of learning uh, for us in the Glargene commercialization process uh, in Japan. What Japan did for us was establish our scientific credibility that we can develop products uh, uh, of, of high quality for developed markets. So back in 2015, that was a big uh, credibility um, uh, mark for Biocon overall. And at this stage, I think while we've been able to understand how that market operates uh, and having a strong local partner like Yoshindo, uh, who's already commercialized products uh, like these biosimilars in the past in that competitive space, and knowing uh, what is required to be uh, successful in terms of the order of entry, uh, I think we uh, we believe we have a very good um, opportunity here with these two assets, which between them have an opportunity of almost $700 million uh, split roughly equally $350 million each. Uh, between Ustekinumab and, um, and Dinosumab. So clearly, uh, uh, we are very excited about this, and um, we see that uh, we should be able to make a success of this in Japan, uh, Hari. Thanks, Riyas. And, and uh, one on the balance sheet, uh, there's a decline in the uh, tangible CWIP uh, in the consolidated balance sheet uh, by around uh, 1,300 crores. So uh, this is related to which facilities? And then the corresponding increase in the net block. So uh, uh, which of these uh, facilities is contributing to this? Indra Neil, go ahead and answer. Maybe Sid, I'll answer that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. uh, yeah, this pertains to capitalization of one of the drug substance facilities uh, that has just gone online and uh, quarter of July to September. Okay, and, and, and Chini, will you be able to quantify the uh, the, uh, the benefit from PLI scheme? And you mentioned that in the context of uh, improvement in margins at, at Biocon Biologics, was it material? 
uh, is what I'm trying to understand. It is, uh, as you're aware, we've been selected under the PLS scheme. The Biocon Group has been selected under the PLS scheme, which entitles us to 250 crores benefits over a five to six year period. So this will accrue over time. It will be now a standard in our PLL going forward. Okay. That's all from my side. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Harit. The next question is from Masira Wasanwala from FSSA Investment Managers. Hey, thanks uh, for taking my question. Um, just, uh, you know, looking back at the history of the company, um, you know, the company hasn't usually taken on too much debt or done very large M&A transactions. Uh, what's different this time that gives you so much confidence to take on the debt you are taking on or the M&A? Um, what are you worried about, you know, as you do this? So let me start with that, uh, uh, you know, question by saying that I think this is a unique opportunity for the company to basically become a global leader in biosimilars. I think this is an inflection point and a huge opportunity for us in a business and uh, you know a segment that is very, very differentiated. I do not think that this opportunity is something that we can ignore or even feel cautious about because we're very confident about the opportunity and the opportunity to grow. We have products in the market, we have products in the pipeline, and we have products which are to be approved very shortly. I think with all this in place, I think we have a huge opportunity to be enormously successful. So I do believe that this is a, a debt that we have to take on to basically transform the business to the next level. We also feel very confident that this is not an unserviceable debt. It is not hugely over leveraging the company. And we are also in the process of looking at investments that can even further reduce the debts that we originally have taken on. So overall, I believe that this is a unique opportunity for the company and for very, very breakaway growth that we have never uh, been able to see before. Thanks. Um, and just one more question. The mezzanine financing that we're taking, um, is there any collateral or cash flows against which this is secured? No, so it would be secured debt uh, against uh, the underlying assets of Biocon Limited. So there will be no other collateral uh, that will be there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Masira. Uh, the next question is from Samir Besivella from Morgan Stanley. Yeah, hi, thanks, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Shas, you must have been through with the contracting cycle for calendar 2023. So if you can just share your market share outlook, especially for Glargin and the other two as well. Thanks, Samir. So for 2023, if you're referring to the US insulin Glargin, uh, I think yes. what we can, uh, we can indicate is that uh, our current customers uh, that we had contracted with, uh, we will continue to, um, to detain those. So we will stay with those markets and which is why we be confident about that growth from where we are today. You heard Matt talk about the NRXs. We will trend towards those uh, mid to high teams that we've guided and, and that seems uh, uh, to be uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, so. Okay, that's great. And for Peckfill and Trust2 as well, if you can share your thoughts. So for, for Trastuzumab, just talk about that franchise first. I think uh, we did go through that uh, dip of around 7.5-8% early part of the year. And as you see, we've clawed that back. So the Beatrice Oncology team has really been uh, chipping away at making sure that we you know gain those accounts. Uh, uh, we've got approvals to, uh, to, to supplement that market. So we really believe there's a there's that 10, 12% market share. We continue to build that going forward. I think there's a, there's a lot of focus. We are hoping Bevacizumab gets approved soon. So we see that happening. We're looking at Peg Philblastin being a very resilient product. We've uh, been in that space uh, long. We had an early mover advantage 
uh, the uh, response overwhelmed us. Now we have significant capacity which should allow us to, uh, to play whichever uh, segment or channel uh, that is available to us. It's a matter of what commercial strategy our uh, Beatrice uh, and Matt and the other teams come up with, but we would have the ability to supply far greater than what it is uh, today. Uh, but, but beyond the US, uh, Samir, what, what the team is really looking at at this stage is to see how we can expand our market shares in Europe as well. And over last year, if I can point out, Trastuzumab uh, has uh, increased its presence in Europe uh, significantly. So that's been a, a good positive. And we see Peg Phil uh, also headed in a similar direction in, in Europe where the market shares will continue to grow. Overall, we see this uh, trending in the right direction. And uh, the team is quite excited to build the oncology franchise now. And with Matt and team, we feel very confident there. Okay, thanks. And I just wanted to revisit, uh, you know, a couple of key numbers for Whitress. Uh, so $1 billion CCPS is being uh, issued at what valuations? And post the transaction, uh, uh, the early understanding was that BBL will have 1.5 billion uh, net debt. So is there any change to that? Uh, hi, Samira. The CCPS, as we meant, uh, indicated previously, was value uh, is based on of uh, equity value of 7.7 .7 billion. So the 1 billion uh, CCPS will convert to 12.9% equity stake in BBL. There is, of course, a cap in a flow. So it can range between 12.9 to 14.9, and this is very dependent on the IPO valuation. Uh, the debt level said 1.2 billion of debt on top of the existing 300 million of debt. So on BBL's books, the debt target is 1.5 billion, which we expect to pay down, down uh, improve cash flows going forward. And of course, for the equity raise from time to time. Okay, great, uh, Jenny. And also, you had uh, earlier indicated that Whitefish most likely will close this year with 875 million top line and 200 million EBITDA. So, any color you can share on that? Are we on track for that? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, you see, uh, Whitefish did release their. Uh, their Q3, that's the July to September numbers, they're at 185 million for the quarter. That gives a run rate of 740 million. We see improvement in the last quarter, which it should take us closer. And keep in mind that this year, the overall, as Shreyas also mentioned, the European revenues have been impacted by the uh, depreciation of the dollar or the euro to the dollar, sorry and some depreciation in emerging markets, emerging currencies. We also have a small moderate effect uh, impacted by the delayed uh, launch of BEVA and ASPA. Okay, and one final question for the mezzanine uh, financing. Will this, uh, uh, over the next few months, will this be then be fully be replaced by private equity or how will it work? Yes, so the, uh, the intent is to replace it uh, partially or fully with the private equity round, but we also do have an option to raise the additional funds of by divesting a few more uh, percentage stake in Sinjin. But we do, of course don't want to keep uh, too much of Mazdeen finance for long uh, on the balance sheet. Okay, and, and quite obvious that it would be secondary sales of your stake. That's to... correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amir. Uh, the next question is from Dhru Singhal. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask about the potential timeline for the IPO of biologics and if we can expect a demerger of Synergy and biologics eventually in the future. I think it would be a bit premature to comment on the timeline, but what we have said in the past, it will not be for the next 12 months or so. And uh, at this stage, we are uh, evaluating various options, including demerger. But again, all these things would take some time before we come out with a plan uh, for our shareholders. Yeah. 
Dhruv, does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dhruv. Uh, the next question is from Parang Marwal from Old Bridge Capital. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time. Uh, just a couple of questions from me. Um, um, it's actually sort of a repeat of what's already been asked. Uh, if I look at the Biocon Biologics uh, business for this quarter, on a Q on Q basis, uh, you know, uh, the revenue has been largely flattish and, and uh, the core EBITDA has moved up quite nicely. Uh, so uh, just referring to the comments, uh, you know, explained, uh, Euro is probably depreciated about 2% on a quarter on quarter basis. And given the market share gains that uh, we've made uh, and the fact that emerging markets is roughly 40%, uh, I'm just not able to, you know, connect the dots in terms of why the Q and Q revenues have been flat. That's number one. Number two, uh, uh, when I juxtapose it with how the EBITDA is actually moved up on a quarter on quarter basis, I'm just uh, uh, finding it a little difficult to understand what's what's been the builder here. Uh, I'll uh, just uh, clarify, as Shushil indicated, that the emerging markets performance is strong overall, but for the quarter, it has been lower than the previous quarter. So sequentially, emerging, though the underlying business is strong, the revenues booked in Q2 is lower than Q1, and that impacted the you know, quarter or sequential growth numbers. So that is one. And as we Shishile also indicated that we expect a pickup of this business in the second half. Moving to the uh, improvement in the core EBITDA, as we indicated in the opening commentary, we had the benefit of the exchange that reflects in the core EBITDA, but gets written up or um, neutralized by the uh, retranslation of our Goldman Sachs investments. So while we had 56 crores gain on the top, we had 59 crores um, loss at the bottom, and that's why it's not reflected in our PPT numbers. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, the second is uh, on on the uh, the the virus acquisition. Um, so. You 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 suggested that the mezzanine financing is going to be repealing, and uh, uh, the financing at biologics would that be? I'm guessing that'll be dollar linked, right? The bank debt, uh, Chini, is rupee linked as well or dollar linked? I think that's a question. But in the mezzanine finance, which will come at Biocon uh, level, will be a rupee linked, and both will be indexed. To a particular benchmark in terms of how it's being priced? Well, it's all uh, the commercial or the market rates or the lending rates, whether it's an NCD or ICD, it's all linked to the current prevailing rates. Okay, thank you. Tarang, just to clarify, the debt and the BBL books will be a dollar denominated debt. And as you appreciate that the revenues that's coming in from the acquisition will also be dollar denominated and is benchmarked to the SOFA index. Tara? Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, next question, I see Dinesh Mahajan. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to ask two questions. Uh, first one is uh, pertaining to insulin glycine. Uh, what market share we have in the long-acting insulin market in uh, India? Any number you can provide on uh, the Basalog sales uh, in India? And uh, insulin glycine uh, coming under price control in India uh, uh, should it impact our margins or uh, can it help us gain more market share um, in, in, in India? Maybe I'll take that. 
Uh, yeah, Dirish, uh, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, Glargene in India, uh, Basilog is doing extremely well if you compare it versus last year. We are growing at more than 25% in a market that's sort of uh, at growing at about 3%. So most of the market changes that's happening is uh, a switch that is happening from uh, the leader to our brand. And that's a very good sign. In terms of market share, we used to be at 11% market share before. Now we are reaching about 13% market share. And that's a very good trend going forward for Glargene. So uh, second question which you asked was on the pricing. Yeah. Uh, most of the discussion that we have in the marketplace is not really about the price. It's about the services that you offer to a doctor. Because in India, as you are aware, Dinesh, this is not a tender-based market. This is largely a retail market. And doctors prescribe this product to patients. So out there in the market, it is offering your services to the doctor, being present for the patient, helping the doctor treat his patient to target. And I believe we did that quite well. And that is why we are growing the market shares uh, of uh, uh, Bazelog. Though we are very unique in the fact that we have got some SKUs which doctors prefer, which is vials in 10 ml, 5 ml and 3 ml which gives significant pricing uh, advantage to the patients as well. So that's the differential we bring on the table to the patients and the doctors in the country. So I would see that going forward, we would continue to grow market share, continue to be dominant with Bazelog uh, in this market. Okay. Now, for, uh, you highlighted that uh, in uh, Indian market, the procurement is less via tendering. Uh, but if you observe uh, procurement in CGHS, Central Government Health Scheme, or procurement by various uh, state uh, uh, state government uh, health ministries is becoming more and more tendered. So are we addressing that part of the market aggressively? If you look at it, uh, this market is growing, you're right, but it's still about 10 or 12% of the total market, which is largely a retail market. I know okay. there are sources like the ESIC, the army, the defense, yeah. the railways who procure insulins. And we have yeah. got a separate team to handle this kind of uh, institutional business as well. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, my uh, next question is uh, pertaining to the US market. Now, uh, with the Viatris acquisition, uh, we soon will be rubbing our shoulders with big corporations like uh, Amgen, uh, LLE, and uh, Sanofi's of the world. Now, what are the key, key hurdles that uh, uh, we face in increasing the market share of our quality products, be it oncology segment or uh, be it uh, Simgly or insulin as part, which, uh, which, which we will be launching in the U.S. market. Uh, like, is it, uh, there is more resistance from medical uh, consultants to ship to biosimilars or uh, it is because of the high rebates which are being offered by uh, the innovator companies to the pharmacies? And how do we plan to address it? Matt, you want to talk to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll start here. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, look, as we look at um, uh, uh, the competition, uh, we see them as any other competition. Uh, we feel with the platform and the foundation that's coming over, particularly in oncology, uh, we, we have a, a robust platform that has these advantages uh, in relationships already established uh, with the physician or uh, ph physician clinics, uh, your oncology clinics, your oncology distribution. So we are a known entity and those folks that uh, are coming from the Beatrice over to Biocon uh, are maintaining those relationships. We do understand how ASP works. So we know those advantages, we know those hurdles in which we can compete very competitively against any innovator. Uh, we also are a known. Uh, we've been around for quite some time, even though it is through Viatris. Uh, the payers understand this, and also in the oncology side, uh, the physicians are very comfortable with biosimilars. To answer your question on how we look at key, key, key winning in these markets, uh, of course, you have to have the economics. That's a starting point. But you also have to have the uh, payer contracts, meaning you have to land the formularies. And what's nice that we have the foundation that we built in the partnership together with Beatrice is then we have the pull through apparatus with the sales force. 
The other thing that will be successful in competing against the innovators, we have the patient services, patient education, and hub services. So we'll have the formulary coverage, we'll have the ability to pull it through, and we have then the ability for patients to be able to afford and pay the medications. And that's how we'll compete very aggressively. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, coming to insulin as part uh, launch in India, is uh, the launch uh, like related to the fate of the court case or it's a separate thing and uh, the DGCI trial thing uh, should continue forward? At this stage, we are still awaiting regulatory approval. We do not have approval of that product. So unless the um, the authorities approve that product, we we are uh, very eager to launch that, but we are awaiting uh, the approval of that. Okay, okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Manish. Uh, the next question is from Vipul Kumar Shah from Sonoma Investments. Vipul? Uh, yeah, uh, so my question is uh, so the uh, biosimilar. Uh, Sales difference sixty percent is regulated market. So can you split it between US and uh, Euro region? Uh, Vipul, uh, your audio is not too good, but I suspect that you asked for the split of the developed markets between US and uh, EU, right? Yeah, that's correct. I don't have that exact breakup, but just. Uh, our developed markets actually, I mean, one where we at trust fund sit, we recognize a third of that in our profit share. Uh, they uh, largely sell, I mean, there's US, there's Europe, there is uh, the Japan or Canada, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and also emerging markets. And so the sales are distributed over a much larger geography. Uh, but I don't have the exact split to, uh, to give you for you to uh, yeah. second order. question uh, relates to our Malaysia plants. Uh, uh, are we breaking even at EBITDA level, uh, Malaysian facility? Can you share some financials of Malaysian facilities? We have uh, had profits uh, for the last three quarters from Q4 of last fiscal. Malaysia has been reporting profits at the PBTPAT line. Can you share the figure for the last quarter? If that is possible. Five million uh, profits for the quarter, July to September. With our net? In dollars, uh, PBT. PAT. PAT? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you and all the best. Uh, thank you, Vipul. Uh, the next question is from Tushar Mamadhani from Motila Loswal. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Just if you could refresh on the outlook for the Serum Alliance-led vaccine business in terms of how do we look at it over the next 12 months? Sort of, I didn't follow the question. Was that, what is the question? Outlook or what? I didn't understand. I think they're asking about the serum transaction and the visibility on that. Uh, she has. Okay. Chini, do you want to give some uh, visibility on that? Uh, Tushar, hi. Mm -hmm. So as you're aware, we have a contractual arrangement with the Serum Institute to commercialize $100 million, of vac $100 million doses of vaccines per annum. Mm -hmm. Uh, underlying, there is a minimum commitment of um, uh, uh, revenues and profits, uh, which is on a full year basis. And so as we have indicated, we could expect uh, revenues in the range of $300 million per annum and uh, with the EBITDA close to our core EBITDA margins, which is the mid to high 30s. So that's the projections for the business. They will accrue on a full year basis on these lines, uh, can't give you a quarter by quarter commitment or guidance. Sure, so that, that's helpful. That's it from my side. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Tushar. Uh, we have the next question from Alankar Garude from Kotak Securities. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I, uh, my question is on the immunosuppressants facility. Uh, can you share some details on uh, the capacity, uh, which are the key products being targeted, opportunity size, uh, focus in terms of developed versus emerging markets? Lankar, we do not give capacities of our facilities, but it's a very large uh, uh, facility. It's a greenfield facility in Vizac, uh, where we'll be manufacturing uh, products like tacrolimus, serolimus, uh, pimicrolimus, and various other products uh, which are uh, under development will also be manufactured there in the future. And uh, of course, we have our existing facility in Bangalore, which uh, has been running completely at capacity. So the growth would come in from this new facility and it will be across emerging and developed markets. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, I got uh, mute. So uh, on that said, uh, if I look at uh, Sirolimus, Tacrolimus, uh, the overall global uh, global market growth itself has been in that 7 to 8% range. I understand we have been capacity constrained because of Bangalore, but uh, going forward, uh, uh, you expect a, a, a somewhat similar growth with this new capacity coming in, or uh, you expect uh, to gain further market share across your existing markets? in some of these products? Yeah, I think it will be both. We will uh, uh, gain additional market share. We have been in discussions with various customers whom we have not been able to lock in or supply in the recent years because we did not have capacities to service these customers. But plus, we also expect our existing base business to grow as in more and more transplant patients are uh, enrolled by our customers. So our base business, uh, both in formulations and API, is also expected to grow. All right. And maybe one final question there. Uh, so we have been present in this space for a, for a very long time. Uh, what would be our key competitive advantages uh, compared to some of our global peers? I think the immunosuppressant space is, uh, is less competitive uh, when you look at the global landscape. Uh, a few of our products like Tacrolimus, Evrolimus, Serolimus, we have a large market share globally in the generic space. And uh, of course, it's the quality, it's the science behind these drugs, uh, which uh, makes us uh, differentiated compared to others. All right. Uh, okay, that's helpful. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Alankar. Uh, the next question is from Nitin Agarwal from Dam Capital. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I just had one question on Efripacep. Uh, a, have we decided to take on that molecule? And two, uh, with the recent sort of patent litigation outcomes uh, in the PTAP, uh, how should we look at, uh, if we taking the molecule on, how are we looking at the commercialization opportunity there? So Nitin, we have, uh, uh, as a part of the Beatrice acquisition, we have the, uh, or option to, uh, to to look at acquisition of that asset, and we are proceeding with uh, with doing that. So we are exercising that right to acquire ILIA. Now, as regards to the uh, ongoing litigation, I think it's in the public domain. Beatrice is uh, in litigation with uh, Regeneron. Um, right now, the it's a restricted patent litigation. The court has decided to litigate uh, only on six patents, and as you've seen, the uh, the IPRs that have recently been announced have uh, have certainly uh, validated Beatrice's view on uh, on the IP. So um, Beatrice is uh, quite confident about its position on these uh, patents and and we ex you know Beatrice believes that uh, you know it will move in uh, in the direction uh, that it has uh, approached it with. So we are very confident there. And uh, just sort of following up on that, uh, you know, if I re recall reading somewhere correctly, uh, the the goal date for the product was somewhere uh, in the recent past. Is that uh, you know is it correct? And and where are we on the approval for the product? Uh, any timelines for approval? Because I think the filing was done some time back, I guess. So as a part of the regulatory process, I think it will go through the uh, the current uh, patent dumps before it can be granted approval. So currently we are in that. Or not be, but at this stage it is Beatrice until the closure of the deal. Uh, it's Beatrice, which is in that uh, current 
uh, pattern dance uh, 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 regulatory process. And once that is completed, only then will we have uh, will we address have that. Nitin, I think you're still mute. Thank, thanks, Jess. This is what I had. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nitin. Uh, if you ask a question, we have the last few minutes. Please raise your hand. Uh, since we do not have any more questions, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining us in the signing score. If you need any further clarification or have questions, please do get in touch with me. With this, uh, I thank you very much and I have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you.